Okay, so data analysis. So this is broken into, into two parts because it's a lot of material um, to cover, but it, it is important, it is foundational um, for what we're doing, um, looking at our data, exploring our data, understanding our data um, is critical to building a, a good risk, risk assessment. So let's jump right in. Um, so in this lecture, um, we want to come out of it with a few things. One is to recognize and identify that there are some different types of data some different ways we can define them, describe them, categorize them, um, and compare them. We want to have always in our minds some, some of the questions um, that we should be asking about our data in order to um, explore it in ways that are useful for risk analysis. And then in this, this lecture, we're going to focus more on how to calculate some numerical summaries of our data that we can use to kind of better understand our data. In part B of the lecture, um, we'll, we'll cover some of the graphical things we can do with our data. So the uh, outline follows the, follows the objectives, right? We're going to give some, some basic fundamentals and definitions related to types of data and how they relate to each other. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some of the questions that we that we should be thinking about to, to explore our data and then um, some of the different techniques and metrics we can use um, to create some summaries of our data. So let's start with different types of data. So again, this is this is this is introductory. it's it's fundamental, um, but it but it is a key building block for risk analysis, right? So so what is, data, right? Kind of important that we make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about data. So generally speaking, data is the result of, of observing or measuring some sort of quantitative or qualitative characteristic of a variable. And that could be any number of things, right? So a variable, maybe it's, you know, annual maximum flood stage. Maybe it's, um, you know, the properties of some sort of strength properties for the soil uh, that our levees built out of, um, some sort of, you know, measure of erodibility of some material, whatever it might be. Um, but we're either observing it or measuring it in some quantitative or qualitative way. Um, and then there's subcategories to that, right, which really get into how uh, how we're measuring it, right? What is it we're actually measuring? So um, common one is we can express data as a number, right? So we obviously we call that numerical or quantitative data. Um, there are two subcategories to numerical data. Um, numerical data can come from some finite set or sometimes called a countable set of discrete values. So maybe it's the number of concrete monoliths uh, for our dam, right? That's some discrete um, number. And it also can be continuous, right? So numerical data can come from some infinite set of a continuous variable, such as um, maybe wave height is one example, right? There's an infinite number of possible values that that variable could take on. So sometimes it's important to, to recognize those differences in, in, in terms of how we think about them for risk analysis in terms of numerical data and whether it's discrete or continuous. Um, the other way we, we often uh, can and do talk about data in a risk analysis is data that belongs to a, uh, a group or a category, and we call that categorical data. So those values um, generally come from a discrete um, set of nominal care excuse me, nominal categories um, that are based on some sort of um, typically qualitative property about our variable and our data. So, um, and, and you'll, we'll, I'll show you an example of that in, in, uh, in one of the next slides. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hold off uh, for some examples of that until um, we get to them. So this is just a general framework, right, for how we can talk about data, what data is, 
and how we can um, organize it for our, our risk analysis. All right. Uh, the other important thing, fundamental thing when we talk about data is how we measure it, right? So remember what data is, is something we observe or measure about some variable, right? So it's important to understand that there's different ways of measuring data. Um, these are, this is a common way of organizing it. It's not the only way that you will find in the literature, but it's probably, probably the most common uh, way that it's talked about. So that's why it's being presented here. But there are basically four, um, four different um, levels or, or think of it as different ways that we can, we can measure um, data. And this, this classification system is attributed to a person by the name of Stanley Smith Stevens, um, and it includes the four scales of measurement. So the first level is nominal. Uh, nominal measurements can only differentiate um, between items based on what category they're in. So that means that when we're comparing items, right, we can only um, evaluate whether or not they're in the same category or in a different category. So what that means mathematically is that um, the quality is the only mathematical operator that we can use with nominal measurements, right? We can only say, is it equal to a category or not equal to. Uh, the next level up, and again, these progressively get, you know, increase in, in what they can do, right, as we move up, up the scale here. So the next level is the ordinal category. Um, so it's, it builds off of each category, builds off the previous category. So an ordinal category can do everything a nominal category can do, plus some additional things. So the additional things the ordinary ordinal category can do is that it can differentiate um, between items based on both the category that they're in and their ranking, right? So think of it like you can rank order things. Um, so this means that items can be compared using a quality, right? Whether or not they're in a particular category or whether they're greater than or less than some other um, category, right? So are they greater than, more than, better than, so on and so forth, right? Or the types of comparisons you can make um, between ordinal measurements. The third one is uh, interval. So interval can, again, it can do everything the previous ones can do, but the, the addition here with interval is we can start to measure um, the degree of difference between numerical values. So this is where we, we definitively start getting into um, numerical data uh, most commonly. So um, an interval measurement includes some sort of numerical value for the items uh, in it. And this means we can compare them by evaluating whether they're the same, whether they're greater than, less than, and then we can also add and, add and subtract them. And then the last uh, category is ratio. So the key characteristic um, for a ratio measurement um, is that you have to have a, uh, what they call a true zero uh, on your scale of measurement. And I'll, I'll, we'll cover an example of that in, a, in an upcoming slide here. So what, what the true zero allows us to do is we can add the, the um, as the name implies, right, uh, we can look at um, multiplicative operations, right, that relate to the ratio of things um, that we're measuring. So let's let's look at a couple examples of this, right? So here's here's just some just a made up hypothetical example for the four types of measurements, right? So for nominal categories, we might want to keep track of you know the agency that's responsible for taking the measurement, right? So we can have different categories, right? So all we can say is whether or not the measurement was taken by the USGS, and we can't say really anything more than that. Um, ordinal, we might use to um, record some qualitative measurement or judgment on the quality of the measurement, right? So is it, and the USGS does this typically when they go out and take discharge measurements, for example, right? They they subjectively rate them as being a good measurement, a fair measurement, or a poor measurement, which loosely should be correlated to how much uncertainty there is in the measurement, right? So in that case, good is better than fair, fair is better than poor, right? So we can compare them, start comparing them that way. Um, interval measurement, maybe we go and collect data on sea surface temperature, in degrees Celsius, right? So um, we then now start to have actual numerical values for our data. 
and we can compare them um, with addition and subtraction operations. And I'll give you a more specific example of that in the next slide. And then ratio, uh, maybe it's something like wave height. Again, we're making an actual quantitative measurement, but in this, in, in ratio measurements, we have a true zero, right? There's such a thing as a, a, a zero wave height, and we can look at um, ratios of, of our measurements. So here's a little more specific example, right, to just highlight the difference between intervals and ratios, right? So intervals, you can compare by the difference and not by the ratio. So I'll give you two quick examples here. So hopefully everyone's at least loosely familiar with the pH scale that measures acidity. It goes from uh, seven is neutral, right? So if you have a pH of eight and you're comparing it to a pH of four, right, you, you're, you can't make a statement that the pH of eight is twice as acidic as the pH of four, right? Because uh, the pH scale doesn't have a true zero. Um, temperature when you're, is another example when you're talking about like degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. Uh, those two temperature scales don't have a true zero. Um, with a true zero meaning the absence of temperature, right? Um, so uh, for example, with temperature, if, if it's, you know, say you're comparing 30 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius, right? You can make a statement that 30 degrees Celsius is 20 degrees warmer than 10 degrees Celsius, right? That's, that's the additive operation, but you cannot make a statement that 30 degrees Celsius is three times hotter or three times warmer than 10 degrees Celsius, right? Because the scale, the measurement scale doesn't work that way because of the lack of a true zero. Um, you would have to use a, a, a Kelvin temperature scale, which does have a true zero if you wanted to do uh, ratio comparisons like that. So hopefully that that just gives you just a little bit of a hint at kind of um, how measurements work and uh, and uh, some examples of them. Um, and, and the key thing is here is, you know, when you're doing calculations on data, right, it's important to understand what calculations are valid and which ones aren't, right, so you don't, uh, you don't get tripped up along the way. And then here's a couple examples just to wrap it up of some valid ratio measurements. Um, flow, uh, so, you know, flow rate maybe in cubic feet per second, right, 100 CFS is twice as much flow as 50 CFS. You know, for length, you know, 10 feet is 10 times more than one foot of length, and then you can do the same thing with durations, right? So, again, you can compare them by both differences and ratios if you have a true zero on the measurement scale. All right, so enough of that foundational material. Um, let's jump into, into some questions we should be thinking about as it pertains to risk analysis uh, when we have data. Um, so there's probably many more questions than this. These are just ones that are common and that come up you know, frequently or should come up relatively frequently. Um, so the first one is what does our data look like? And we'll get into how we can do that numerically and graphically later in these presentations. Um, what should the data look like, right? So sometimes we have a sense from theory or from experience or from whatever, right? That we have a sense of what the results ought to look like. So we should be exploring our data and asking ourselves, does it look the way it's supposed to look? Um, what's a typical value? So again, in you know, in risk analysis, knowing what a what a what a typical value is, is important in terms of uh, estimating risk. Um, how much do the values vary? So that that's more about uncertainty, right? So how much uncertainty is in our, uh, in our data? And then sometimes we do comparisons, you know, how similar or how different are two different sets of data, right? So if we have two sets of data, um, sometimes we wanna see, you know, are they similar enough that we can use both? Do we have to treat them separately? Um, or how are we going to use them in our risk analysis and whether or not they're, you know, similar enough or different enough um, can drive that decision. And then a couple more questions here that come up in statistical analysis a lot. Um, are the data independent? So that, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, say, and again, I, you know, my primary background is in flood hydrology, so you're probably going to hear a lot of uh, flood hydrology related um, examples and analogies over the four weeks, but you know you can as you're going through ponder how it might apply to your applications. But um, so, for example, for independence, right? Does the does the does the chance of it raining today depend on whether or not it rained yesterday, right? Or um, or does um, 
you know, next year's annual maximum flood depend on how big this year's annual maximum flood was? Um, those are important questions in terms of how we do our statistical analyses. And then are the data identically distributed? So, so independent, and we'll get into this more later. Independent means that one, uh, one value is not affected by the previous value, right? So this year's flood is not affected by the flood that happened last year is an example of independence. Um, identically distributed, so that basically just means do the data all come from the same generating process? Right, so uh, an example of that would be, um, you know, are floods caused by the same processes or do we have a scenario where we have floods in the early spring that tend to be caused by snowmelt and floods in the late spring that are more typically caused by rainfall, right? Those, those events, uh, so data from those two different time periods might not be identically distributed because they have different generating mechanisms. Um, and then are the data stationary? So when we're talking about changes that occur with time, either due to climate change or, you know, land use changes or some other change, right? Um, does the data um, behave the same way over time or are things changing, right? Is, is temperature going up with time? And then the last one is what's an appropriate model for the data? So this is kind of understanding, you know, what the data looks like but also what it should look like, right, in terms of what um, uh, what might theoretically be appropriate uh, for a particular application. All right, so let's let's get into some actual actual analysis here. So we're going to start with some some stuff on um, how we summarize data with numerical summaries. And again, this this is this doesn't cover everything. There's lots out there, but these are some of the basics that will help you get a good foundation and a good start for summarizing data. We're talking about uh, five different ways um, to summarize data in this section. Um, one is, and some of these were on the pretest, so you'll recognize some of the concepts, hopefully. Uh, frequency and relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and then we'll talk a little about percentiles, um, and then we'll wrap up with a um, what's called a five-number summary of our data. And again, all of these are aimed at just just ways we can come up with simple metrics that we can apply most of the time to any data set, right? So that we can start to make some inferences and judgments um, about our data from these, these simple summaries. So let's start with a couple definitions. Um, frequency, first one. So frequency, it's pretty straightforward. It's just the number of data that are equal to some reference value or if you're dealing with continuous data, some, some range of values, right? So when we have continuous data where any data, any value is possible, right? We typically have to um, bin it or, or define ranges of data and then decide whether a specific value falls within a range. Um, if you're in with discrete data, we typically are um, looking at just a specific um, reference value because we have a discrete countable set of values. So subtle difference there, but but um, but that's the difference between reference value and range. And then relative frequency is simply the frequency that we calculate divided by the total number of data, right? So it gives us a kind of a relative measure. So you can kind of think about it a way. There's there's a lot of a lot of things in math where we try to um, kind of normalize things, if you will, to kind of um, allow our brains to better interpret what we're seeing. So relative frequency is the, the one, of, one of the ways we do that with, with data. Um, so we just take the frequency divided by the total number of data. And we'll, I'll show you an example of how that's calculated in a later slide. And then cumulative frequency is the number of data that are less than or equal to a reference value. So this will come up later also in statistics when we talk about distributions. Um, when we talk about cumulative, um, frequencies and probabilities. Um, we're always talking about the number of um, data or in probability, in the probability world, the probability of being less than or equal to. So for cumulative frequency, we just count up the number of data less than or equal to our reference value or our range, and that's the cumulative frequency. And the same as it is with relative frequency, we can calculate a cumulative relative frequency, which is simply the cumulative frequency divided by the total number of data.
So let's look at an example so we can kind of see how this actually works. Um, so here we have some data. This is just uh, quality of measurement in three categories, good, fair, and poor, with how many measurements we've made that fall in each category. So if we want to calculate the frequency, it's, it's really trivial here, right? It's just the number of values in each category, right? So 2684 and 115 for each of our three categories of data. Our total number of observations is 225. And then when we want to calculate relative frequency, we can simply take the number of observations in a given category divided by the total, right? So if we take 26 divided by the total number of data, which is 225, we get 12% um, as our relative frequency. And we can do that for all three of our um, categories of data. And again, the nice thing about relative frequency, right, is it kind of normalizes everything to a, a scale of 100%, right? So the total should add up to 100%. And we can really quickly see, right, that basically half of our measurements were rated as being good. Right, so relative frequency, again, helps, helps us maybe draw some conclusions a little more intuitively, a little more quickly than maybe frequency does. Um, and that's, that's one of the benefits of it. But again, pretty simple. If you're doing this with continuous data, right, then, then your, your categories would just be ranges of values. And you would just do a simple count of how many measurements fell within each range. And, but the, the general approach and calculations are the same. All right, now let's look at cumulative frequency, the exact same data. This time we're interested in cumulative frequency, so we want to know how many of our measurements were uh, less than good, right? So they were either fair or poor. If, you know, for whatever reason, we might want to know that. So again, this is just, we just accumulate our values, right? So we go from the lowest, we, we order things from the lowest to the highest, smallest to the largest. Uh, worst to the best in this particular example. And we just uh, accumulate our count of measurements by basically just doing a running sum as we work our way up through each category from, again, from lowest to highest. Um, so in this case, our first our first category is it's, it's only poor. There's nothing less than poor, right? So that's 26. Our second one for cumulative is fair, right? So that means it could be fair or less than or equal to fair, which means it could be fair or poor. So we add up those two values, right? Just do a running sum, 84 plus 26, we should get 110. And then for good, right? Good is means if less, again, it's less than or equal to, right? So good means it could be good, fair, or poor. So we just total these up and we get 225, which is also our grand total for the number of data. And again, the exact same way, um, we did cumulative frequency, we can do, or we did relative frequency, we can do cumulative relative frequency by just taking the cumulative divided by the total number of data. So again, these are in percentages. And again, you can, you know, draw inferences about this simple data set, right? You can say, well, based on this cumulative relative frequency value um, that I have here in the second row, 49%, right? I can say that, well, roughly half of my measurements are either fair or poor in terms of their rating. So again, just ways to explore the data, think about the data, and, uh, and answer some of those questions about your data. All right, moving on to percentiles. So percentiles, this is a, this is a formal definition, but we'll see um, it's not too bad when you get into calculating them. So um, the, P, the P percentile, right? So, um, so in this case, we're selecting a percentile and we want to calculate what value of our data corresponds to that percentile. So it's defined as, as the value of our data such that at most P percent of the data values are less than, um, less than the data value. So you can think of this as being like a cumulative, um, think of it as being like a cumulative relative frequency, right? So it's, we're talking about the less than or equal to condition. And we're trying to find if I, if I select a percentile, say the 25th percentile, what, what value of my data um, corresponds to that such that 25% um, of my data is less than that data value. So for me, that's always a little counterintuitive, but, um, but that's how it works. There's, there's at least a half a dozen different ways to calculate um, percentiles. 
Um, none of them are wrong. This is just one of those ways. This is the way that's generally recommended by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, there are other methods, but you typically start by deciding, uh, by selecting the percentile. Um, and then you have to calculate the corresponding value of the data. So the way you do that um, is you start by sorting or ranking your data from the smallest to the largest value. So from one to N, where N is the number of data, one is the smallest, N is the largest. You select a percentile, any number between zero and 100%. Then you have to do this uh, this, this little calculation um, here, of P over 100 um, times N plus one. And that'll give you a number. You then have to separate, and I'll show you numerical examples, so don't worry if, if this is a little bit confusing. Um, then you have to separate that number into an integer part and a fraction part. And then there's some rules there on the right-hand side, which I think are better, better explained with an example showing how to do the calculation when you separate it into an integer part and the fraction part. The reason for doing that is you often, when you pick a percentile, you often, when you have, you know, a discrete number of observations, you often end up in between two data values. So this integer and this fraction part and this formula here on the first bullet on the top right is basically just doing a, a simple interpolation. So, um, you find the closest data value, and then you interpolate between two data values to get the exact percentile. So that, so it looks, I don't know if it looks daunting to some of you or not, but if it does, it's just a simple interpolation. And then in Excel, Excel has a built-in function, percentile.exc, that does this specific method. And uh, if you're using a statistical software package like R, um, they often have built-in functions as well. So you'll see some slides throughout this presentation that have built-in functions that uh, will do some of these things. So let's look at, let's look at a real example. Um, hopefully this makes it easier to, to grasp. So this, um, this, first, this first column on the far left is just uh, data that we collected, 10 measurements, um, just in random order here, in the order we collected them, right? So the first thing we do is we, got, we wanna rank them from the smallest to the largest value. So this second table here ranks them from one to 10, smallest to largest value and then this third table on the right is where we want to calculate various percentiles uh, and we'll see if these percentiles in this example correspond to what we'll talk about later in terms of a five number summary so um, so there's a example calculation here on the right hand side for the 25th percentile right so we plug in um, 25 for p as our percentile divide by 100 and then multiply that number by n plus one, where n is 10, right? So it's 25 over 100 times 11. We should get 2.75. What that tells us is that our 25th percentile that we're trying to calculate is between our second and our third smallest value, right? So it's somewhere between, between um, our second and third ranked value, right? So it's between three and four. And since it's in between, right, we have to do interpolation to decide, you know, and this is just by convention, right, decide how, where in between are we going to pick. And it's just a, a simple um, straight interpolation. So we take the fraction part of this number, which is 0.75, and we just assume that it's 75% of the way between our second and our third value. So it's 75% of the way between three and four, right? So that's what that formula does, right? It does that calculation for you, and you should get um, you should get three point seven five um, as your number, right? Which should be seventy five percent of the way between our second and our third ranked value. So that's how that works. And like I said, the built in formulas and software packages do all this behind the scenes for you. But if you're interested, that's what it's doing. It's doing that calculation. So for me as a flood hydrologist, this is this is the way I'm used, this next slide here is the way I'm used to thinking about percentiles. And so in this case, you do percentiles by rank. So what you do is you calculate the percentile for each specific data value. So when we do things like plotting positions, um, this is what we're essentially doing. Um, we normally, in, at least in flood hydrology, we normally do plotting positions by exceedance probability. Um, this basic method for percentiles 
uh, and the example that's presented here is non-exceedance probabilities because that's that's more general and more standard. Um, so uh, in this case, we want to calculate a percentile that corresponds to each of our data values, right? So we have the same data. So the, this first little table on the far left, same data, just in the order we collected it. The second table, we again, the exact same way, we rank the data from smallest to largest. And then um, in these last, uh, these last two columns, we calculate the percentiles based on the rank of the data. So the formula, the generic formula for that, some of you will recognize this formula for plotting positions, right? This is the general formula to calculate percentiles by the rank of your data. Um, M is the ranking of the data, right? So M from one to 10. N is the total number of data. So N in this example is 10. And then A is a parameter that can vary um, to do different types of of percentiles or plotting positions. And these, there's just a few listed here. There's a whole host of other ones available and they all have specific applications. Um, some are, some work better for certain types of probability distributions. Um, some, you know, some are set up to minimize errors and bias and et cetera, et cetera. Things we'll cover a little bit later on in the course. The most common one that's used the vast majority of the time is the Weibull plotting position formula because it's unbiased for any any probability distribution. So that's A equals zero. So if you just plug in A equals zero, those terms drop out, right? You just get, get M over N plus one. And then there's other ones here that, you know, are, are used in various applications. We're not going to cover all the details. You often don't see huge differences between them anyway. So it's oftentimes in, relatively inconsequential but just more for your awareness that they, you know, alternative um, values of A do exist and, and might be uh, preferred for specific applications. But you're generally in pretty good shape if you just default to the Weibull. So then there's this last column here, you can see then the percentiles we get that correspond to our specific data values. All right, next one is the five number summary. So the five number summary is, um, you'll see the graphical version of this is commonly referred to as the box and whisker plot, but it's a way to give us both an estimate of the range, or actually three things, the, the range of our data, um, kind of the, the typical or average value of our data, and uh, uh, an estimate of the, or a characterization of the uncertainty in our data or the variance. So in this case, um, we're doing um, quartiles. So quartiles are basically just taking the range of percentiles, right? And dividing it into um, four, four equal pieces, right? So essentially 20, 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100. Um, so quartiles are just um, correspond to percentiles. We get four equal parts that we can summarize with five numbers. Uh, defined by these percentiles, right? So the zero quartile is at the zero percentile. It's going to be the minimum value of your data set. Uh, the first quartile is at the 25th percentile. The second quartile is at the 50th percentile, which we'll see later in the week is also commonly known as the median of our data. Uh, the third is the upper quartile. That's the 75th percentile, and the fourth quartile is our maximum value, which is our uh, 100th um, percentile. So again, you can get three, three, three general observations about your data from this, right? One is it, what's a typical value? So the median is one way to, to uh, estimate a typical value. You can get an idea of how big the, you know, how much uncertainty there is, and oftentimes that's by looking at the difference between the first and the third quartile. Um, how, how big is that spread? And then you can get an idea of the full range of the data from the minimum to the maximum by looking at the difference between the first and the, or the, sorry, the zero and the fourth quartile. How do you do that in Excel? So Excel, at least last time I checked, um, you got to use a couple functions to do this in Excel. So you can do the quartile function uh, to get um, the quartile one, two, and three, which is the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. You can also use the median function to get Q2, um, but 
quartile will do Q1, Q2, and Q3. And then for the min and max values, Q0 and Q4, you typically have to use the min and max functions because this um, quartile exclusive function um, doesn't work at the zero or the doesn't work when the percentile set to zero or 100, right? So uh, the workaround is just use min max. And then base R as five num as the built-in function for the five number summary, and it'll it'll do all all five numbers for you. All right, so here's an example of a five number summary. Um, so again, the exact same data we saw in previous examples, uh, exact same ranking we saw in previous examples. So um, the first quartile is our 25th percentile. So remember we calculated that before where we had Percentile was 25, right? So it'd be um, uh, 25 over 100%, right? Times n plus one, which is 11. So that gave us 3.75, which means we have to interpolate between, um, I'm sorry, 2.75. Gave us 2.75, which means we have to interpolate between our second and third rank data, right? And we want to pick the value that's, you know, we have the integer part of two and the fraction part of 0.75. So it's 75% of the way between three and four, which is 3.75. Um, the median is the middle value. Uh, but in this case, um, when we do that calculation, we get um, 50th percentile divided by n plus one, which is 11, right? So we end up having to calculate. Um, the number that's halfway between our fifth and sixth values, right? Because we have, we want five of the values above and five of the values below. So that'll give us essentially our ranking, you know, notionally is 5.5 for the median. So halfway between our fifth and sixth ranked values. So that'll give us halfway between four and five, which is this example is 4.5. And you can do the same thing for the other uh, percentiles. Again, zero quartile is our minimum two, fourth quartile is our maximum or eight. And again, so you can get it. You can get a feel for right. Minimum value is maybe a little less than five. You know, the the uncertainty range is, you know, generally, you know, plus or minus. Is that plus or minus one to one and a half, right? And then the full range of our data might be plus or minus two to three, something like that. So again, just just different ways we can um, summarize. So a question in the chat about quartiles. So I, I will touch on outliers um, later when I get into uh, the graphical depiction of this as a box and whisker. So maybe hold that thought. And then if you still have a question, ask, re-ask re it then. Um, there are, there are again, there's not like only, like if you look this up in the literature, you won't see one official standard way for doing some of these things that's you know, universally adopted. So the question was, can we use, um, can we have a low outlier threshold and re remove some of, the, some of the either low or high data from our ranking? You will find in the literature, some authors will suggest doing that, right? That you can, uh, rather than use the minimum and max, you might set a, a threshold where, you know, if, if a minimum is so far outside the norm that you want to exclude it, right? And so that is, uh, possible, it is allowable, and there are some publications where you'll find um, techniques for how to estimate whether or not something can be classified as an outlier. And you'll see one of those later when we do the um, the graphic, or actually in the very next presentation when we do the graphical version of this. Does anybody have any other questions? Geometric mean used in a risk assessment. Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, so the general answer is yes, and, and where geometric mean is commonly used is when you're working on a logarithmic scale is probably the most common application. So, um, the, you'll see, you know, you'll see different formulas for geometric mean, but a geometric mean is essentially an average calculated on the logarithms or calculated in log space. So um, again, you'll see, you know, there's lots of different ways to 
calculate average or typical values, right? You, there's a mean, a median, a mode, geometric mean, and there's others as well. Um, so where you will see a commonly used geometric mean in risk analysis is a couple places. One is on uh, risk plots, if you're doing like a semi-quantitative risk assessment where we, at least in the core, we represent a risk estimate by a box that is on a, on a log scale, our risk plots are on a log scale. So we might have a plot with probability of failure on the vertical axis, life loss on the horizontal axis, and it'll be on a logarithmic scale on both axes. And that, that box we use to portray the risk estimate will be uh, generally an order of magnitude in size. So if, you know, for whatever purpose, if we want to, if we want to assign a quantitative number to that risk estimate, uh, because we're managing this in log space, um, we will typically pick the middle of the box as our representative value for that risk estimate. And in log space, the middle of the box is calculated as a geometric mean. So if you just if you just took the average, right, just a straight arithmetic average, and plotted it, it wouldn't on a log scale. It's not going to plot in the center of the box, right? So um, that's one example where, at least in the core, we commonly use geometric means um, for risk estimates. And we, we treat that risk estimate that's represented by that box. Um, we, we, we can attribute it a, a point estimate, right? And that point estimate is usually calculated at the center of the box, which on a log scale is the geometric mean. The other application you'll see is if uh, in doing risk calculations, if your um, if your input functions, so like in a risk analysis, right? When we calculate risk, we have input functions like a flood hazard curve, a system response curve, and a um, consequence function. So oftentimes in risk analysis, you will pick different methods for interpolating values on that function. And there are cases where um, taking a straight arithmetic average is good enough, and other cases where by taking a different type of average, like a geometric mean, you can get um, more accuracy in your risk calculation. So uh, the simplest way I can describe it is you think of um, think of a risk calculation as being essentially solving an integral, uh, which uh, the solution for an integral basically is representative of the area under a under a function, right? And one of the ways we can estimate an area under a function is to use like something like a trapezoidal rule or a rectangle rule. You know, if we all took introduction to calculus way way back when, for me it was many many years ago. But you know that was one of the techniques you probably learned early on, right? It was either rectangle or trapezoidal rule. So oftentimes our risk calculations are essentially set up to use that type of method to solve a risk integral. And so what can happen, like say with flood frequency curves, um, they are often closer to being uh, linear if we put them in log space for the, say the say stage or flow. Um, and in those cases, when you're trying to calculate, say you're trying to calculate the trapezoidal rule and you want to calculate what the representative um, value should be as the average over that trapezoid, right? If if you're dealing with a function that's logarithmic in nature, right? You can use the geometric mean, and it will get you a little bit more numerical accuracy in your calculation than if you took an arithmetic mean. Um, if your input function is linear, right, then you'd want to use the arithmetic mean. So um, there's a you know, kind of a technique that um, I loosely refer to as linear, linearization, right? So it's basically picking the method uh, based on um, based on based on how you can portray your function in a way that gets it as close to being linear as, as you can. Because oftentimes in our risk calculations, we do linear interpolations and lots of other linear calculations. So if you can transform your input functions so that they are um, closer to being linear, you can get more accuracy in your risk calculation. Again, often it's 
it's not enough to make or break a risk estimate, but um, the, the common example would be a flood frequency curve where it's going to look, it's going to be closer to being linear if you transform the, say, the stage to log space. And when you do that, then your risk calculation, when you apply something like the trapezoidal rule, is going to also, for the same reason, be more accurate if you use a geometric mean instead of an arithmetic mean. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer. Hopefully that all makes sense. And I think we'll we'll cover some of that a little bit later in the week. So maybe we'll we'll see this again and circle back to it. <laughs>